Is it started? Oh, yeah. OK. Perfect. Uh, thank you. OK. Uh, welcome, everyone. So this is um, uh, the first uh, interim meeting, the OAuth Working Group interim meeting. Um, just uh, as a reminder, uh, not well applies here. So if you're not familiar with this, please make sure you understand uh, uh, what that means. Um, what we're uh, going to talk about here is um, security BCP uh, this week. So we still have uh, two more meetings. Um, um, next week, we'll be talking about is logged in and web ID. Uh, so make sure to uh, attend this meeting. And uh, in November 30th, um, we will be talking about DPOP. So this is uh, our schedule for uh, the coming um, a few weeks. Um, before we uh, switch it to, uh, or give it to Daniel, I just want to um, talk about one topic. Uh, there was some uh, flare of activities around, uh, or flare of discussions about uh, OAuth 3.0. I just want to make sure that it is clear uh, that the, currently the OAuth Micro Group is not working on any new version of OAuth protocol. Uh, and uh, we are working with uh, uh, with Roman to kind of put an official statement to clarify uh, the proper way of bringing um, any work to the uh, OAuth work group and working on a, a new version of this protocol. So, um, so this is just a, a statement, um, just to make it clear what what uh, the status of uh, of any work on the OAuth that three dot zero here. Is. We don't. We don't. We're not working on any anything like this, and we will talk about a proper way of doing this. Okay, so that's uh, that's uh, all. Uh, all we have from a kind of a, a chair's perspective. Uh, I will hand it now to uh, to Danielle to talk uh, talk us through. Uh, stop sharing here. Uh, to talk about uh, security BCP. Thank okay. you. Okay, let me find the right screen here. Okay, you should now see something? Yes. Excellent. Okay, um, welcome everybody here today. Um, we want to talk about the OAuth 2 Security Best Current Practice document, um, which is a draft by Torsten, John, Andre, and me. Um, the document itself, as I guess most of you know, um, sets out to describe the best current security practice for OAuth 2. Um, it updates and extends the OAuth 2 security threat model. We try to incorporate experience from practice as well as from research um, and cover new threats that are relevant to OAuth 2. Um, in particular, also those that arise in high-risk environments, um, for example, in open banking environments or when OAuth is used to, um, yeah, in, in EID schemes or for electronic signatures or applications like that. Um, this is a relatively old draft. Um, I think it started in 2016 or something. Uh, we had the first working group last call end of last year. That was on version 13. We got a lot of feedback on that, very good feedback, um, but it also meant we had to do a lot of work still. Um, now we are at version 16, and I think that things are looking much better than they did last time. Um, so yeah, so let's let's go through the changes that we made since version 13. So what's new? Um, one thing is that we noticed that you can do something which we called pixie downgrade attacks. Um, relatively simple, an attacker uses a stolen non-pixie bound code and injects it into a flow where pixie is actually used. Um, if the authorization server can handle both uh, non-pixie flows and pixie flows, then the uh, authorization server might accept the non pixie bound code, although in the current flow, the client thinks it's using pixie. 
to protect itself. Um, we have a more detailed description of the attack, of course, in the document. Um, our new recommendation regarding uh, this attack is that authorization servers must ensure that if there was no code challenge in the authorization request, a request to the token endpoint that contains a code verifier uh, must be rejected. So this is, as we heard, also something that uh, implementations actually, or some implementations already do. Um, so I suspect this is a relatively small change. Then we have some uh, smaller changes regarding uh, Pixie and nons and the recommendations around that. Um, a new recommendation is that, uh, uh, I think it's a very natural thing, Pixie is now a must for public clients. Um, we kind of missed to, to state uh, this uh, very clearly in the old versions. Um, so Pixie is a must for public clients and there's no way around it. Um, you can't use uh, nonce in this case. Um, just as before, you can use uh, nonce instead of Pixie for confidential clients. Pixie is recommended, but you may use nonce if you also observe some additional precautions. These additional precautions are essentially that you must ensure that the nonce um, is checked properly and from the correct ID token. That is, if you have an ID token, uh, both at the token endpoint, as well as in the, in the authorization response, then um, you must also check the nonce in the first one. Um, so that's, that's something we stated very clearly again in this draft, um, because it might not be obvious to implementers. And then we had another, a couple of other important changes. Um, something we discussed in, I think it was the last call um, regarding the security BCP um, somewhere earlier in the year. Um, we discussed a new wording around the implicit grant. And this is also, I think this has been discussed um, very extensively. This wording is now what's, what also can be found in the document. Um, a smaller change, as you know, as you probably know, um, we say that you um, that you should use um, exact string matching for redirect URIs because it protects from a couple of attacks. And um, we we now have one um, caveat to that, which we've taken from the native um, apps BCP. We say that if you use a local host redirect URI you may use variable port numbers because um, native applications just might need that. We also covered two new topics um, regarding the text. First one is essentially just one paragraph. Um, what happens if you have cross-site scripting? Of course, this can undermine your token replay protection if um, somebody can inject code into your application. And um, we also have a, a section on click checking attacks, um, which is um, essentially completely new. In the last call, we also discussed um, what we want to say regarding MTLS. MTLS is now um, the kind of suggested method for token replay protection, but it's not longer um, as it used to be the only recommended option. We have also gotten feedback that um, the discussions were a bit, let's say, lengthy. So we discussed um, several approaches to, um, to, to mitigate some attacks. Uh, some of these dis discussions were not very um, helpful. Because they discussed uh, things yet that might not be very practical. Um, so we tightened the text around that. And um, we improved the examples, also feedback free we got from the working group last call. And of course, we made um, several editorial improvements. Um, so this, these are the changes in a nutshell that we made um, since the last working group last call. Um, so what's there left to discuss? Actually, I think not too much. We have two things that I'd like to discuss um, today, and of course, also on the mailing list um, afterwards. Um, this one has already been on the mailing list. Um, as you know, 
we say that um, because we now um, have Pixie as a mandatory feature, um, you should also publish both metadata to tell your clients that you actually support Pixie. We say that you can have um, a deployment-specific way to communicate, communicate Pixie support, but OAuth metadata is recommended. But this is only for the AS side of things. What we currently don't say is that clients should actually use this. As, um, so this came from discussion uh, with Guido and the other guys uh, at the Stuttgart University. We found that it might be a good idea to actually recommend OAuth metadata to clients for their discovery process. We can reach several goals with that. Uh, first one is we can promote automation in the sense that you can now um, use features just based on this discovery process. So you might also be able to use advanced features uh, like PAR or JAR uh, just based on this discovery process. Um, this also affects security features. Of course, Pixie is a prime example, but it also reduces the chance for mistakes. As you might know, in the FAPI, um, in the current FAPI specification, there's a paragraph that says um, that one venue for attackers might be a misconfigured token endpoint. Of course, this is, um, is something that can happen if you configure the token endpoint manually but it's less likely to happen if you have a metadata document that you can um, pull this information from. So I think it's a, it would be very useful if we would see um, broader adoption of OAuth metadata and it actually improves security if we, if we recommend each client to use OAuth metadata if available. Of course, it just makes OAuth also easier to deploy but it also makes security features easier to deploy. You have essentially solved one, uh, one part of your key exchange problem if you want to use uh, signed or encrypted messages. And um, it might also promote the use or the concept of the OAuth issuer, which can also help um, to mitigate OAuth mix-up attacks. Speaking of which, um, Regarding mix-up attacks, so this is the second topic I'd like to discuss today. Um, the current recommendation, as you probably know, is that you should use, um, so you must mitigate mix-up mitigation. And one way to do that is to use separate redirect URIs per issuer. That means that if a client um, can work with multiple authorization servers, the client should have a different redirect URI, URI registered at each of the authorization servers. This was a result of the um, discussion uh, on how to solve the uh, mix-up attack. And I think we settled on that because it's, this solution is based on existing OAuth features. But it turns out that it's not always the best solution, I think. For example, and this is a, a problem that we actually have at yes.com, uh, this solution is not suitable for schemes where you have a centralized uh, client registration. Um, so the client just registers once and can use many or uh, authorization servers or issuers, so to say. Um, I, I think this is a pattern you often see in open banking schemes. This solution also, as you can tell from the um, text that we have in the uh, BCP, needs a lot of explanation to developers. So what do they need to do? So why do they need to use a separate redirect URI per issuer? What is an issuer? Um, is a separate redirect URI per authorization server okay? Or is it not okay? Uh, what's the difference between the authorization server and issuer? What exactly to, to, pull, or to put into that um, URI and so on? Um, and it's also easy to get wrong. And I think the, the best argument uh, against this solution actually is um, it's very hard to automate in libraries because the library um, might not know about your URI, um, uh, how, how your URIs are built, um, what you put into that into these URIs and so on. Um, so it's a, I, I still think it's a 
valuable thing to have, but I think there are better solutions. And one such solution is something we also discussed very early on in this, uh, this whole mix-up topic, is to put an ISS parameter into the authorization response that tells the client um, which issuer the authorization server thinks it belongs to and which was used in that um, authorization process. This ISS parameter is something um, that, um, again, we discussed very early on already in the process. So it's actually um, the solution that we have in the, in the first paper where we described the mix-up attack. We already had the solution with the um, issuer parameter, and we already proved formally that it actually solves the mix-up attack. So it's a very um, good mechanism against mix-up attacks. Uh, Carsten, who's Carsten Meyer zu Seelhausen, who is also on the call today, um, he uh, wrote, uh, he created a new draft, um, which specifies exactly that, an ISS parameter for the authorization response. I think he also already posted on the uh, mailing list today. Um, the draft defines the ISS parameter and an, uh, a respective metadata flag, of course. It's a very short draft. Um, I think most of the parts, most of the things in the draft um, tell about um, how this source mix up. Um, it's, uh, again, it's formally proven already. And I think if we had this ISS parameter, um, this would be easy to automate on the fence that is very easy to automate in OAuth implementations in libraries uh, that evaluate that metadata flag. So I propose that we uh, put this into the uh, security BCP. So we could say that clients must prevent mix-up attack, attacks either by using the per issuer redirect URIs or by using the ISS parameter where we would then point to that new document. This, this is Mike Jones. Can I reply to that? Sure. Um, if you're using an ID token, you already have the issuer parameter or the issuer value, so you don't need the parameter. So just like we did with nonce, you should describe that if you have an ID token in your flow, then you already have the issuer and can use it. That's the valid point, yes. Thank you. Aaron, can I ask a question about this? Sure, go ahead. It seems like another way to solve the attack is for the client to maintain state itself. So it knows the request initiated. Is that a valid way to solve it as well? Um, well, the, how would the client know where the code came from? Same way it is storing the Pixie code verifier. Well, the the um, the client so the client just gets a an authorization response, and it just doesn't see where it comes from. So the client just gets it from the browser, and this is just a redirect to the client containing a code. And since, of course, the code is opaque, can't tell where this if this code is coming from the um, attacker AS or the honest AS. I guess my point is that it already has to store uh, state. It already has to store the Pixie code verifier to know to know send that in uh, with your authorization code. So it seems like it could also store where it expects the code to come from. And if the code is coming from an attacker, the attacker could just as well swap out the ISS parameter. Yeah. Um, Exactly. So this is so the client in uh, when using this um, this mitigation, the client would need to do exactly that. So the client would need to know um, which ISS parameter is, it expects in response. And the nature of the mix-up attack is that the authorization response always comes from the honest AS directly from the honest AS, and the attacker 
cannot um, intercept the, the authorization response from the honest AS. Because of course, if the attacker could intercept that, that authorization response, then the attacker wouldn't need to do the mix-up attack in the first place. So if you do mix-up, you know that the authorization response comes from the honest AS. So it's um, not tampered with, and the ISS parameter is um, the original one. Daniel, could you just walk through that as to how does it protect about a bad uh, ISS sending it? Sure, sure. Um, okay. How would we pull off a mix-up attack? Um, let's say you're using um, OAuth metadata. So the whole thing starts with, um, as you know, in a mix-up attack, you have one client and at least two issuers. So one issuer is um, honest.com and one is attacker.com. These are the issuers. And um, the user would go to the client and say, I'd like to use um, attacker.com as an issuer. Um, so for example, by pressing a button, um, I don't know, authorize with attacker.com, I don't know. Um, so the client starts the interaction with attacker.com, uh, retrieves the metadata document. And in the metadata document, the, client, the, the attacker acting under the issuer attacker.com would say, my authorization endpoint is honest.com slash auth, and my token endpoint is attacker.com slash token. OK, so the metadata document points one thing, the authorization endpoint to the honest one, and the token endpoint to the attacker. Now, what happens is, of course, the client sees that metadata document, evaluates the authorization server URL, and then sends the user to that authorization server. And that is honest.com slash auth. So the user sees honest.com's authorization endpoint, um, logs in, authorizes the client for access, and then gets sent back to the client. So the client receives an authorization response, which comes from honest.com slash auth, contains a code for honest.com. But the client, of course, still thinks that all these things are happening with the issuer attacker.com. And now the client will, of course, want to redeem that code for an access token. So the client goes to the token endpoint. And the token endpoint, of course, is um, attacker.com slash token. So what happens is the client sends the code that it acquired from honest.com to the token endpoint attacker.com. And at this point, um, the attacker knows the code. And um, yeah, so uh, essentially, it's it's game over at this point. Of course, you have then um, features like Pixie making this attack harder, um, and, and and other things. Um, but still, uh, to get defense in depth, you need to prevent in the first place that the code uh, can reach the token endpoint of attacker.com. So if you had the ISS parameter in the authorization response. Then, of course, in the scenario that I um, just um, showed, the honest.com slash auth authorization endpoint would put into the authorization response the issuer honest.com, because the honest.com authorization server knows that it's acting under the issuer honest.com. So the authorization response arrives at the client, and the client sees, OK, this response comes from honest.com, while me, uh, while I as a client am thinking uh, I'm acting with, or I'm, I'm interacting with attacker.com. So the client would see the mismatch there and then can um, stop the transaction. And the whole thing also works if you don't have metadata, but then you need to um, Essentially, you need to need a deployment-specific way to, to say what is the issuer, so to say, in that case. 
um, which can be as easy as a fixed string that you know that uh, Facebook uh, always sends this string and Google always sends this string. Thank you. Makes sense. Thanks for describing that. Can you explain how Pixie does not solve this? Well, Pixie kind of does. Um, so with Pixie, the code would arrive um, at the wrong token endpoint. But of course, the um, the the, um, the attacker wouldn't know which Pixie verifier to use for that code. Um, problem is that, first of all, we don't know if Pixie was used. Of course, if you follow all the recommendation, Pixie was used. Um, but if you don't, then you still have the mixer problem. Second is that there might have been um, a chance for the attacker to influence the authorization request in the first place. Um, for example, by, by kind of proxying that through his own uh, server. And that means that the attacker could know which code challenge was used. If that code challenge was um, clear text, then of course, um, the attacker would just uh, know the code verifier. Um, otherwise, the um, attacker might be able to just select their own code challenge in the authorization request. So the idea would be that in the metadata document, the attacker would not write authorization endpoint is honest.com, but instead the attacker would write authorization endpoint is attacker.com slash proxy. And attacker.com slash proxy would just change the authorization request. I think I see that. Um, last question. If a client is only ever interacting with one authorization server, none of this is necessary. Is that correct? And if so, can that be explicitly stated? Yes, that's correct. And yeah, I, I, I see whether we have that already in the text or otherwise we'll need to put that there very explicitly, yes. Anything else? Okay. Any anybody has any other questions about previous slides? Okay. So so Daniel, um, like do 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 you think? We, you you want to wait for this document to kind of progress and then kind of uh, see how that goes before we kind of continue to move this document along? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, I think it's, it's, um, it's time that we publish the security BCP. And I think by putting the ISS parameter into a separate document, we've um, kind of decoupled those, that's at least what I hope. Um, of course, I know that um, it's, it's, it could be a problem to uh, link to, uh, to, to reference um, what is right now an individual draft. Um, so I think it would be great if we would find a way to proceed with the security BCP um, more or less independent of the other document. I'm not, not exactly sure what we would need to do. For that. But I guess that this could help me out there. Yeah, individuals that specifically, so it uh, will be a challenge. Roman, do you have any any thoughts on if we can progress the document with um, an individual draft uh, in our reference? Sorry, but I, I don't understand the question. Could you say it again? If we can't yeah. progress the document, what? Sorry. So. so so that it seems that uh, what what Daniel is trying to do is here is um, is trying to describe an attack and refer to uh, an individual draft, which is just public. was uh, there is lots of noise on the on the bridge. So if you are not seeing, can you please go mute? There is lots of noise. Well, somebody is is doing something there. So 
So the, the point is, the question is, is there a, a way to progress a document through the ESG with a reference to an individual draft still? Uh, sure. I think a couple of things matter. It depends on the track we want to publish this particular document in. Uh, you know, ultimately what will happen is if you have a document that has a, uh, a normative reference uh, on another document that is not yet published, it'll sit in the RFC editor queue as a misref until uh, until they're deconflicted. And then depending on the track of that other document, uh, you know, if you have, for example, have a standards track document that you want to advance, but the reference is normative and if it's informational, we're just, we'll just need to make sure that we appropriately broadcast uh, the, the down ref during last call. Um, this is Hannes here. Uh, I was wondering, like I was listening to Mike's comment early on, with, uh, he was saying that the uh, ID token, so if you use the ID token, you essentially have that parameter in there already. Is that also something that we need to take into account in this whole debate or write-up? I, mean, that... I, would, I would ask that, this is Mike again. I would ask that we update the document with the resolutions to my comments and the resolutions to Aaron's comments before we would do another last call. Yes, that would be the plan anyway. Right. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, but, yeah, the plan wasn't mm -hmm. kind of to but, 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 last call right now. Mm -hmm. But, but still, I, to the other point, uh, Rifat and, and Roman, um, like if it depends on how we reference that uh, solution specifically in the document. If it's referenced as a uh, informative, um, then obviously it, there would, it wouldn't be blocked, but otherwise um, clearly as Roman explained, it would be sort of stalled till this other document is completed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, this could be a chance, right? So it, it looks like we have kind of two ways to transport the ISS. Uh, not the not the space station. Um, for, in the authorization response, one is the ID, ID token, one is a separate parameter. So um, this could be, in my opinion, an informative reference um, in the beginning, at least. Uh, I mean, as long as the solution is described in the BCP text, uh, I could also see the you know, further details on the attack as being in informational because they would not be required to be known to implement the solution. And as long as we keep to that line, I, I think we can have that that arrangement. But it would actually be the solution, not the not the attack. But um, we we would, I mean, in the in the security BCP, we would, we would we could say. If you have a way um, of, of uh, sending the issuer from the um, authorization endpoint uh, to the client, then that also solves the problem. And one way could be the ID token and informative reference, this other draft. Yeah, that, that could, uh, I think that could then make it a, a normative, uh, informative reference and that, that would be good. Okay, why would that be informative? Like if if the ID token is not there, then the right way to do it is through uh, this parameter. So it's not going to be informative, right? Yeah, yeah, but at least, sounds, uh, yeah. No, it sounds like the security BCP would be saying you need to solve this attack. And there are several options to do that. You could also make up your own solution, however, it would then point people toward the standard, the intended to be standardized version of that, which is this ISS parameter. Yeah. Thorsten speaking, you could you could uh, uh, see it that way. The security PCP states um, the parameter could be a solution, and then you draft picks up on that point and makes it an interpretable standard. Okay. Mm. Okay, I guess we, we need to think about uh, a way kind of to progress this. Okay, so then it, then let's... Would it, would it make sense just to go ahead and define the parameter and the associated okay. metadata in the security BCP and avoid the logistics? I know that was, folks were trying to avoid that, but um, 
but but then then the the document wouldn't be a BCP anymore. It would be a standard track, right? Because you're changing, introducing no functionality, right? Well, I I'm not sure. I, I, it's not clear to me that that's the case. Just including a one additional parameter and and how it's used. Um, I, I guess I would defer to. That. This is Roman speaking. It would feel a little odd to me to be registering new parameters in the BCP document. It right. seems like that document should be pointing to all the Existence. other things that have the guidance and having the normative language around using using those protocol features or not or whatever is the appropriate yeah. caution. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's fair. It just seemed like potentially it's less awkward than all these various attempts to downplay a down ref or back ref to a, an individual draft document. Although I presume that this discussion sort of presupposes the, the adoption of the other document and attempts to progress it quickly. I mean, this is something we could also just um, uh, just try to, we could just try to progress with the security BCP and see how much um, need for discussion there is with the other document. Um, it is a relatively short document um, and very concise. So maybe maybe this progress is quick enough. Otherwise, we could still think about how to reference that properly. Okay. Okay, so then I guess for now, you still have the, some work to do, uh, Daniel. Uh, let's update this document based on the feedback you, you got today um, and see if we can have some discussion about this new draft. And if we can make a progress on that uh, in parallel and see how far we can go with this. Exactly. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. Any any other questions for Daniel? Yes, this is Danny speaking. Go ahead. Go ahead. Do you have a question? Okay. okay. It's a topic that I already raised on the version 15. Currently, the section 3 states the updated OT2 attackable model is supposed to have been updated to account the potentially involving multiple, multiple parties. However, it still misses to address the case of dynamic relationship between clients, which includes scenario of collaborative clients. Now, on November last year, Daniel wrote, I have the feeling that this attack, which means a collaborative attack, aims at breaking a security property that OAuth does not claim to fulfill, fulfill and that nobody expects OAuth to fulfill. Well, I believe that the attack should be mentioned, and it has two flavors. Let us suppose that you have a token that contains only a verification of the age, saying that the person is more than 20, 21. Well, this kind of token should never be accepted by a, a, a server, because in case of a collaboration between clients, you cannot know who has forged or has provided the token to the other client. However, if the token includes the subject identifier, you know that who is the person doing the impersonation, and now you feel in the problem of impersonation. And see, it means that the way to control the, the attack is basically to always include a subject identifier that allows the service or the server to, auto, to basically authenticate the owner of the token. So I believe that this should be mentioned in the document. Okay, Daniel, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I think we've discussed this attack a number of times, um, also in different working groups. Um, and it seems that there's, so, so I still stand by what uh, Dennis quoted, 
um, that this seems to break something that nobody really expect or to provide, um, which is also um, kind of supported by the I don't know the my general impression that that um, this this discussion of the attack um, has not brought us um, really to 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 the conclusion that this is is an interesting attack, so to say. Um, just one one thing that I also pointed out before: this attack is covered by the attacker model. Um, collaborative clients is something that can happen. Um, the thing is, it is not covered by the kind of security goals that people expect or to fulfill. And um, yeah, so I don't really think that this is something we should cover in the security BCP. Well, collaborative is not a word that exists in the current BCP. So collaborative clients do not exist as well. As you mentioned, this kind of attack can happen. And we should say what should be done in case that attack happened. And mention that there is a way to counter that attack. And this should be mentioned. Again, collaborative clients are covered by the attacker model because uh, clients can, of course, send messages to each other. Um, this is also something that we covered in the formal analysis where this attacker model kind of is derived from, um, where clients can collaborate. So they can collaborate to reach a common goal. Could you point me to the text where you have the word collaborative in this document? No, this word is not in the document. We just say that clients can send messages to each other and they can act together. So um, it's, it's much more than that. It's, it's not sending way. messages is making cryptographic computation for the benefit of the other client. And this is never mentioned in the document. Again, I, I recommend you to read the original formal analysis, which covers explicitly this thing, this attack. Oh, well, there is no section dealing with that problem in the BCP. That's a, that's a key point. And there I should guess, be one. Uh, yeah, this is this is Hannes here. Um, um, yeah, I wonder. I so I I see uh, two aspects here. One is um, to the question of uh, like how well is uh, this aspect covered uh, rather in the document itself rather than in in uh, reference documents? Uh, and can we can we do a better job in in pointing uh, these things out on what's covered and what's not covered? Uh, the other aspect is um, I'm sort of talking about uh, solution aspects and having an agreement on a group whether this is uh, something they uh, worry about in in OAuth. And I I, I know that in like uh, what people care about in a group in terms of attacks uh, changes uh, from time to time. Uh, but maybe maybe that's something to to think about and and. Um, I can kick off uh, an email to discuss this aspect as we, as you are, uh, Daniel, as you are updating the document uh, for the other issue we discussed before. Does that, how does that sound? Yeah, um, I think we should also, in the, in the interest of publishing the security BCP, consider um, this maybe for a future update. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Any any other questions, comments? Okay. Then I think uh, we're done for for today, and uh, we'll uh, we'll see you next week, guys. We, we still have a another interim next week, next Monday, same time. Okay. Thank you all. Thank Bye. you. Thanks. Thanks for the feedback. I'll distribute the meeting minutes as soon as possible. Awesome. Thank you.